I want to thank you all for coming, and I'm going to give you over to uh, to John Levin. I want to thank Patrick and Andy for hosting this uh, this book event. Uh, I we're going to have uh, four readers, including myself. Uh, I'm going to uh, read from the introduction, and I'll be followed by Jason, who will uh, uh, read uh, Anatole's piece, Anatole Anton, and then uh, Margaret Leahy and uh, uh, Steve Hyatt. A little better. Great. <laughs> Maybe I'll move over here. Okay. <laughs> Today, if anyone knows anything about Students for a Democratic Society, it is most likely the Weathermen, a small SD fa SDS faction of a few hundred whose story has been recounted in films, histories, and a stream of autobiographies. This drama follows a familiar arc of development. Frustrated by the continuing war in Vietnam and repression at home, the Weather Underground turned to revolutionary violence and belief that their actions would inspire others to join them in revolutionary struggle to overthrow the U.S. imperial state. Not surprisingly, their attacks had the opposite effect, alienating and frightening potential activists. activists. After three weathermen blew themselves up making a bomb destined for the GI, a GI social dance at Fort Dix, the group fell apart. This action program, while regrettable, was perfectly understandable and coherent from a liberal point of view under the heading, Frustrated Idealism Goes Gone Wrong, and over the years, Weatherman became the official story of SDS. The reality was quite different. SDS at its apex numbered around 100,000 students whose political, political views reflected a rainbow of ideologies. There were Democrats and anarchists, socialists and communists, pacifists and Trotskyists, Marcuse alkalites and Gramsci aficionados. But mostly SDS were young idealists exploring the ideas of all of the above with a curiosity and a willingness to risk any, everything in an effort to create a world without war and racism where social justice prevailed. When SDS splintered at its 69 convention, a majority of the voting chapter delegates supported a slate of officers in a program promoted by the, by the SDS Workers' Student Alliance Caucus, also known as WSA, which argued for a building of a strategic alliance between students and the working class believing such a coalition was key to forcing the U.S. government to end the war in Vietnam and address the economic inequality and racial oppression. Racial oppression. The origins of WSA lie in the early 60s when a group of radical factory workers from Buffalo, New York, in alliance with African-American activists in Harlem and students from New York City universities, formed the Progressive Labor Movement. Almost without exception, they were all former members of the U.S. Communist Party who had been expelled from the CB because they sided ideologically with the Chinese Communist Party and the Sino-Soviet Schism. PL was neither the first group that broke with the CP nor the last, but its open advocacy of communism and bold activism defined and separated PL from other CP splinter groups, who mostly focused on intellectual debates regarding the direction of the new communist movement. Although the majority of the original PL members were in the labor and civil rights movement, there was a small group of students as well. It was their organizing of the first trip of U.S. students to revolutionary Cuba in 1963, in defiance of the U.S. government's travel ban, that PL had its first significant impact on the growing student activism in the U.S. Many of those students attended a, social, a conference of socialists and communists organizations at Yale University in March of 64, where PL called for national demonstrations on May 2nd of that year under the slogan, U.S. Out of Vietnam Now. A committee was formed under the leadership of PL, and subsequent demonstrations were the first national protest against the war in Vietnam. It led to the formation of the May 2nd Movement, or M2M, a self-described anti-imperialist peace group, primarily focused on U.S. involvement in Vietnam. In the fall of 1964, Lyndon Johnson ran, a, ran for president on a platform that pledged, pledged no wider war in Vietnam, declaring no American boy's blood would be shed on Asian so soil. In February of 1965, a short month after being inaugurated, LBJ 
dispatched 100,000 soldiers to Vietnam, quintupling the number of U.S. troops on the ground. Students, many of whom saw themselves as prospective cannon fodder, were scared and outraged. SDS, previously a uh, civil rights and anti-poverty organization, rose to the occasion and called for a demonstration in Washington. SDS leaders were hoping for maybe 5,000 participants, but more than 100,000 chanting demonstrators poured on the Capitol Mall, and SDS became the de facto leadership of the student anti-war movement. Meanwhile, Peel at his national convention discarded the description of itself as a movement and reconstituted itself as a communist, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist party governed by democratic centralism. Besides being disciplined, PL could count, and after the SDS and after the SDS demonstration in DC, it was clear that SDS was where the students were. PL's national committee instructed its cadre within M2M to dissolve that organization and join SDS. After a pro forma discussion with M2M and over the strenuous objections of members both within and outside PL, M2M officially was dissolved itself in the spring of 66. PL's strategic goal was never to take over the leadership of SDS. They recognized the fact that SDS was a mass organization representing various views and factions. And even if PL and its allies could wrest control of SDS, it would be a pyrrhic victory. PL's strategy was to win SDS members over to an anti-imperialist analysis of the war in Vietnam and U.S. foreign policy, as well as an understanding of the importance of an alliance with the working class and black liberation movement to, to build an effective movement and to recruit cadre. PL and its allies later became the WS, uh, became, who later became the WSA caucus, formed activist SPS chapters on campuses around the country that pro pro focused primarily on the Vietnam War and racism. They continued participating in SDS national meetings, arguing politics and introducing resolutions, most significantly the Student Labor Action Project, or SLAP, which advocated an alliance between students and workers. SLAP's, SLAP proposed a summer work-in where students would get jobs in factories and do outreach among students around war and racism. The summer work-in was a success and led to the formation of the Worker Student Alliance Caucus. The 23 essays in the book are not the voices of national leaders or media-designated luminaries. They are the voices from the guts of the student movement. They are the activists who spent their evenings writing leaflet about, leaflets about the Vietnam War and were up at dawn passing them out on campuses and high schools and at subway stations and factory gates. They organized camp chapters, circulated petitions, formed picket lines, faced down cops, went to jail, and joined or allied themselves with a Marxist-Leninist party in pursuit of creating a better non-racist world based on economic and social justice rather than maximizing profit. Many of the contribution, cont contributors remain active in the social justice movements today and are keen to share the accounts of their experiences, both good and bad, and hope that another generation of activists can learn from them, as well as take heart that they are part of the struggle for social justice. So I want to first introduce An <laughs> Anatole Anton, who uh, voice is impaired, so Jason, uh, his assistant, will read for him. This is Anatole. I'm Jason. Uh, I helped him write it, um, but it's all, it's all his words. All right, so I will be speaking for him in the first person, so just pretend I'm Anatole. All right. I was a graduate student at Stanford University in the mid-60s, working toward a, towards a PhD in philosophy. I was in my 20s, torn between my desires to be a successful academic and a full-time activist. At that time, I called myself an independent Marxist, and I styled myself along the lines of Monthly Review magazine. I tried to figure out what it would mean to be a revolutionary Marxist. In truth, I felt that being a Marxist was a long-term proposition, and I didn't know if I was really up to the task. Having been on the first progressive labor organized trip to Cuba in 1963, however, and having tried to keep up with the literature on Marxism, I felt that I was at least on my way to getting a better grip on political issues than my careerist peers at Stanford. There were very few of my fellow students who were focused on opposing and exposing the war in Vietnam. 
which was becoming more of a priority for me along with the civil rights movement. I took a trip to New York in the summer of 1964. The Harlem riots or rebellions had just taken place. Friends in PL and the May 2nd movement, along with others, were building a free university on 14th Street, and the anti-war movement, movement was mushroom, mushrooming. I returned to Stanford with, with renewed energy to oppose the war in Vietnam. The civil rights move, movement humbled me. I felt that it had tested both my courage to take a principled stand against racism and my commitment to become a real Marxist. Coming out of the McCarthy era, I wanted to make it clear that I was not a, Mar a communist, while nevertheless advocating for Marxism. I didn't want to be ostracized, so I dodged the issue by verbal sleight of hand, sidestepping any specific questions about my connection with communist thought. Given the stigma attached to the word communism in that era, I shied away from it and was drawn more to socialist terminology, which tended to be reformist. By independent Marxism, I meant unaffili unaffiliated with either a communist party or Marxist orthodoxy. I thought they were ultimately superficial in their analysis. So now I'm gonna, we're going to talk about the Cuba trip. I learned about the Cuba trip from my friendship circle, most of whom were fellow travelers of PL, or members of PL. I quickly became aware that PL had organized this trip as an attack on the Cold War by exposing hundreds of students to the depth and excitement of what was happening in Cuba. Members of PL were ubiquitous throughout the trip. Thanks to them, I came to better, better understand the Cuban Revolution. At first, my parents didn't know about the trip. I had told them that I was accepted into a PhD program for the fall and that I was going to study near Woodstock. But they learned about my real intentions when the FBI showed up on their doorsteps, fishing for information and trying to use their concern to dissuade me from going. Even without the FBI, my, my parents disapproved of the trip. My father told me not to be a schmuck. He thought it was a stupid thing to do because it would cause me a lot of trouble and probably th threaten my, my plans for grad school at Stanford. But I was determined to go regardless of the consequences. So I signed up for the Cuba trip, despite the fact that it was illegal to travel there. My friends and I were attracted to Cuba by the culture and fascinated by Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. Most importantly, we felt we had a right to go to Cuba and see the revolution with our own eyes, regardless of what we were told by the U.S. State Department. We believe that the First Amendment protection of freedom of speech included a freedom to travel as well. We did this as an act of civil disobedience, and there was never any doubt in my mind that I, as a U.S. citizen, had and still have a right to travel where I want. Thus, we were challenging the reasons the State Department had for not allowing us to go to Cuba. I felt that the burden was on them to prove to me that I didn't have the right to travel where I desired. That if they wanted to strip my rights, they had to have a good reason to do so. And I did not feel the reasons they gave were sufficient. I was consciously supporting Justice Douglas' interpretation of the First Amendment, which was that the burden of proof is always on the one who wants to shut free speech down. The Cubans were tremendously hospitable. I saw a country in its early stages of liberation. It was a very vib vibrant society. You could feel a pulse everywhere. And the music and the stories people had to, the stories people had to tell in their small shops, in the streets, and in their ever-present knowledge of recent Cuban history. I remember an inspirational trek that our group took to a spot that had been a revolutionary center for Fidel Castro and his July 26th movement called Minos del Frio, which was revered as a monument to the revolution. Young students who come to Minos del Frio to make themselves aware of the dangers the revolution had held for its founders. It certainly lived up to its name since it was both cold and high in the mountains. I distinctly remember being out of breath as I, ascend the mountain, or as I ascended the mountain. A friend of mine, Richie Velez, was encouraging me up the mountain as I was grasping for air. To the Cubans, going to that place was a way of keeping the memory of the Cuban revolution alive. Besides this physically challenging site, I also remember the scenic beauty of Cuba, such as Veradero Beach, and was impressed by the Cuban people's attitude toward public places. Veradero Beach had it all, beautiful beaches and vistas, as well as a strong night, nightclub life. The, the Cuban Revolution had taken this spot, which was, which was once reserved for tourists and the wealthy, and gave it to the Cuban workers as a place to vacation. The most memorable moments of our trip was our meetings with Fidel and Che. Che was a particularly good and witty commentator. 
He went around the room asking the members of our student group and what their majors were. One young woman answered political science. Che took the opportunity to inform us that, in his opinion, politics is an art, my dear. When asked about revolution, Che said it comes into being by putting pressure on the facts and that it is not made sitting down. Fidel engaged the group by challenging many of us to ping pong games, most of which he won. In these games, one could feel what it would be like to have easy, friendly relations between the U.S. and Cuba. After all these years, my clearest impression is that they presented themselves as ordinary human beings. There was no effort to venerate themselves. How are we doing on time? Doing okay? All right. When I returned to the U.S., the House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, H-U-A-C, managed by a, a diminutive congressman, John, Joe Poole, immediately subpoenaed me. The recent legal rulings on the First Amendment were favorable to, uh, towards us. We neither were nor pretended to be intimidated by Poole and his gang of politicians. One of our members, Arthur Kenoy, am I pronouncing that right, Angel? Yeah, yeah. Okay. A lawyer who had helped develop our defense was actually kicked out of the hearing room with Poole and his associates citing him for contempt of Congress. Kanoi asked what the rules of evidence were, since we were on uncharted legal waters, and Huac re refused to answer. Spearheaded by PL and other radical groups, there were demonstrations in New York and Washington, D.C. in response to the Huac hearings on the Cuba trip, which lasted a couple of days. This was the end of the McCarthy era, but Huac still believed that communism was taking over the country, and they were the ones to stop it. Obviously, Traveling to Cuba was thought by them to be a crime, and they were going to make an example out of us. Nothing of substance came of the hearings, nor was there any official ruling on our right to travel to Cuba. A case similar to ours, however, involving the journalist William Worthy, resulted in a ruling that HUAC was acting in unconstitutionally in restricting travel to communist countries. These hearings were instrumental in closing down HUAC for good. Still doing okay? We got one more paragraph, and we want to shout out to uh, Jim, Jim O'Connor or James O'Connor. Yeah. So there's one more thing that I feel I need to say in writing this autobiographical note. I realize now that many of our failures stem from our more fundamental failure to follow the best among us. For me, that was James O'Connor. He was thought by many to be the most imaginative and creative Marxist economist who tried to put Marx back into Marxism. I felt that he was leading the way, but only a few were following. His leadership tended toward a collective approach, and he was perpetually in search of gifted students who were interested in communism. He set standards for debate, for theory, and for relating theory to practice, particularly regarding the 60 student strikes that were happening at universities all over the country. He opened up the whole field of Marxist ecology, clarifying why red had to be simultaneously green. In the process, he and his comrades founded two important journals, Capitalist State, which took on the task of developing a theory of the state that was Marxist through and through, and Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, which tried to set the foundations for a Marxist ecology movement. It was he, more than anyone else, who studied the nature of corporations and talked about the corporate form of organization. That is the end. The Workers Student Alliance or WSA, was not an organization. It wasn't a party or something you really joined. Rather, in my experience at San Francisco State College, the WSA was the name given to a group of people who tended to view issues in similar ways and vote the same way in meetings. Most time, they voted with the members of Progressive Labor Party, or PL. My understanding of these issues, how they came about and were related, as well as my political alliances, developed as a result of my participation in actions at state in 1960, beginning in 1967. In 1967, I wasn't particularly political. I did care about civil rights and the war in Vietnam. But I really hadn't developed any understanding of the causes of segregation and the war, nor did I see any relationship between the two. 
More importantly, I didn't see anything that related to my experience, anything in my life that made these issues personal. This began to change in September 1967 when I enrolled in my first international relations course taught by Professor John Tito Girassi. I don't remember the title of the course, but my experience in it changed my life forever. I had no idea who the professor was, but everyone else seemed to know who he was and what his politics were. His most recent book, The Great Fear in Latin America, seemed to be a reference for others in the class. Okay, come on, page three. I knew this would happen. The book was known by everyone else but me. I was astonished when I first read it at my own ignorance of the long history of U.S. exploitation of the nations of Latin America. Feeling completely out of my element, but fascinated with the discussions in class, I sat back and I listened and I learned. Pretty soon all those pieces that were atomized in my brain began to come together and what was happening in the world around me really began to make sense. All of this might have remained academic had not a particular event occurred on campus. In November, an editor of the alternative paper was suspended for writing an alleged pornographic poem about the football coach. Soon after, a group of African-American students was suspended for allegedly beating up the newspaper editor of the official school paper, The Gator. The black students had gone to the paper to protest a racist cartoon that they had been running about Muhammad Ali. A fight ensued and the black students were blamed for starting it. In each instance, both the editor and the black students were suspended without a hearing. In response, a group organized as a movement against political suspensions, MAPS. A student meeting was called to discuss the situation and develop a response. Believing that everyone was innocent until proven guilty, I readily went to the meeting. And I felt comfortable going because the organizers of the meeting were students I had in my IR class. Students whose viewpoints I had learned to respect. Mm. Maps demanded that the president reinstate the students until a hearing was held on each case. The president agreed to reinstate the newspaper editor, who was white, but not the African-American students because he said they were quote-unquote violent. In my opinion, that was prejudging the student's behavior before any kind of academic hearing, as well as obviously racist. Maps once again demanded the student's reinstatement and threatened to sit in if reinstatement had occurred by December 6th. Well, the president didn't reinstate the black students, and following a noon rally, students marched to the administration building, where some would sit in as threatened. When students reached the administration building, the doors were locked with a padlock, but the doors were glass, and soon someone kicked them in. I don't know who. About the same time, Professor Girassi and some students, including Kay, a leader of the Persian students, climbed through a window into the president's office. As I moved up the stairs to the front of the ad building, I saw the broken doors and students going through them. 
At the top of the stairs, I had to make a decision. Was I going to take a stand and act against what I really believed to be wrong and join my fellow students? Or would I just stand there safely and observe? I went in, and I guess I never turned back. The action that day was isolated and did not get much of the student response except frightening. In the meetings that followed, people discussed why they thought this was the case. Why didn't people support us? The conclusion was twofold. First, we really hadn't taken the time and done enough organizing among the student body so that they understood the issues. And second, as a result, we allowed the administration to characterize what occurred. And they did, calling it simply a violent act which included outside agitators. Again, certain people's analysis made the most sense to me. And I learned that they were members of something called progressive labor, whatever that was. But over the next year, I learned the various groups involved in an umbrella organization, SDS, and which individuals from which groups made the most sense to me. Usually individuals from PL and what became known as the Workers' Student Alliance were the ones that made the most sense. And this was really solidified in November 1968, when the Black Student Union and the Third World Liberation Front called a student strike, demanding the creation of a College of Third World Studies. SDS was asked to join the strike in support of a set of demands they put forth. I remember very clearly an SDS meeting called to discuss participation where a real major difference occurred. Some individuals wanted SDS to make its participation contingent on an additional demand, that is, ending the war in Vietnam. Others, myself included, strongly disagreed. First of all, the strike was called by the VSU and the TWLF with very specific demands. Fifteen of them. And with the BSU and TWLF in the leadership of the strike. SDS was asked to join in support of those demands and to respect the leadership. Additionally, to me at least, the demands were something that could be accomplished on a college level. The college really couldn't stop the war in Vietnam. Maybe most importantly, some of those wanting to add the extra demand were very uncomfortable, it seemed at least to me, having the primarily white SDS in the secondary position. The strong role paid by individuals in PSL, PL and the WSA in articulating this second point, stands out as a moment I knew with which group I stood. Now that's not to say I didn't have friends who weren't in either one of those groups or in any group whatsoever. I had friends throughout SDS. I listened to everyone and stood with those whose arguments made the most sense to me at the time. As I got to know people associated with PL on a personal level and became friends with them, I found we had many things in common, although we didn't agree on everything. Progressive labor looked to an alliance between workers and students to affect social change. Other students and groups were more concerned with what I would call student power, and the cultural issues of the 1960s. 
Having started to work at the age of 15 out of economic necessity, I understood the needs of those who work with their hands, because I had done it. But I had also had the opportunity to go to college, and in doing so was exposed to new ideas and had the time to analyze, think about those ideas. While I believe that students had the absolute right to demand relevant education, I didn't believe that overall social change could come about out of academia. I learned how political and economic and social systems were connected, and that these interconnections were organized to benefit those who controlled the overall system. As such, I associated with what became known as the Workers' Student Alliance. The strike lasted four months and is said to be the longest strike in the history of the United student strike in the history of the United States. During that time, individuals in the VSU, the TWLF, SDS, and many, many unaffiliated students in the thousands participated. Every morning, people met on the picket line, set up right at 19th and Holloway at the entrance to the university. Rain or shine, we marched from morning until the noon rally. Occasionally, the police would attempt to grab one of the people they were most interested in arresting. Attempts at individual arrests happened on campus as well. Certain people were obviously targeted, such as anyone who was on the VSU or TWLF Central Committees, members of the progressive labor leadership, such as Bridges Randall and Harry Dillon, Gordon DeMarco of WSA, and Kay, the leader of the Persian students. And while people fought to protect each individual from arrest, Most of us knew that Kay was the most vulnerable. He was quite vocal and active in the anti shah movement in the Bay Area. His arrest could lead to an immediate deportation back to Iran and certain torture and death at the hands of the Svak, the Shah's secret police. I remember the one time he was arrested he had to be bailed out immediately and driven out of the country. By that time, I had somehow become the person running the bail fund. In fact, Anatol used to call me bail fund, bail fund Maggie. If I remember correctly, this all started on one of the first days of the strike when the first arrests occurred. People were passing the hat, sometimes literally, to get bail money. Someone with a car was needed to go to Bears Bail Bonds. To bail those people out. Since I had a car parked near campus, I was chosen to go to Bearish. And we went to Bearish because that place was known as the place that bailed out those arrested during various sit-ins in San Francisco. Their slogan was, don't perish in jail, call bearish for bail. <laughs> and we certainly took them up on that as over hundreds of people were arrested over those four months, some of them many times. Going to the bail office after a day of walking the picket line and running from the cops soon became the norm for me. The need for everyone to be able to count on everyone else to cover their backs really made people closer. Acquaintances became friends and sometimes lifelong friends. I'm still in touch with many and some of them are here tonight. I haven't been able to remain in contact with Kay for obvious reasons. He's underground. But I recently learned that he was still alive and I broke down in tears of happiness. He was someone special. <laughs>
When I recount my experiences during the strike to others, I'm often asked why, if I was politically close to members of progressive labor, I never attempted to join the party. The fact that it was a party was really at the core of my decision. As a party, members were expected to act in accordance with decisions made through a process of democratic centralism. As such, even if you disagreed with a particular decision, if word came down that it was to go on, you followed, you complied. I was and am too damn independent to be bound by such discipline, although I know the reason behind it. I need to really personally reason things out for myself, sometimes obviously with the help of others, but always to make my own decision at the end. Maybe this is because I'm shanty Irish. <laughs> or maybe it's just because I'm fiercely independent and stubborn. I don't know. But I'd like to think it's because I'm Irish. The final reader tonight is uh, Steve Hyatt, who was not only contributed an essay to the book, but was instrumental in designing the book and doing the co final copy edit. And to him we owe a great deal of thanks. Yeah. Steve? I have um, the unusual task of talking about socialism in Iowa. Um, although you may have seen, a, there, there's a chapter in Paul Buell's um, a graphic history of SDS about Iowa um, from somebody who was very much an opponent of the Worker Student Alliance uh, Caucus. And it's, so it's um, um, in some ways very perceptive. I'll say a few words about it uh, later on. Um, and it's also filled with lies, but uh, other than that, um, it's an unusual experience because um, the Iowa City SDS chapter and its Worker Student Alliance Caucus, which led that chapter for much of its life, um, uh, was not in a place where there were any PL members. So we were um, associated with uh, progressive labor uh, leaders, and one of whom is one of the editors of this book, Earl Silbar, who was one of the, the uh, um, student leaders in the Midwest region. Um, but our chapter got started, um, interestingly enough, also about this chapter. I don't think there were any red diaper babies, so very unusual. Um, <coughs> They were blue diaper babies, children of liberal Republicans. But in Iowa, this meant that you had grandfathers who fought in the Union Army. And therefore, by descent, you were on that side. And Democrats may have voted for Roosevelt, but they also, some of them lived in sundown towns like Dubuque and Natoma and so forth. So there were some cultural things that led certain folks to if you were for the Civil Rights Movement, you were probably, you might have Republican parents rather than Democrats, strangely enough. Um, and I got involved through my cousins, one of whom uh, um, is also represented in this book, Bruce Clark, and his older brother Paul, who had started an Iowa uh, Friends of SNCC chapter in the early 1960s. Uh, and who thought, and I'm discussing things with people in Chicago at one point, you know, this SDS thing is, looks good, let's, let's start one at the University of Iowa. Uh, which she and about 20 other people did, and they had their own little uh, economic research and action project, which didn't amount to much, but they had the right idea. Um, and meanwhile, his somewhat younger brother, Bruce, was involved in the civil rights movement in Des Moines, um, working with a woman named Edna Griffin, who had, uh, was the leader of the, the core chapter in Des Moines, and who had led a uh, sit-in, um, early lunch counter sit-in in Des Moines, segregated uh, Katz Drug Stores, 1946. Uh, and they won. They won both a uh, threat by the local trade unions to picket and strike, and they won a court case, and they desegregated Katz Drug Stores. 
Um, so she was around, and she was, um, as you can tell, um, she'd been around the CP, so there, there were some red influences here, although no, none of their kids. Um, and a somewhat cantankerous prison. She didn't take much shit. Um, so she was a good um, mentor for a lot of people like Joe Barry, who's also represented in this book from Des Moines, uh, Bruce Clark, Paul, um, and a guy named Jim Dunn, who was a, uh, a youth leader in a settlement house on the near north side of Des Moines. And so these folks were in the early 60s uh, doing um, uh, work on a, a, a local uh, equal housing ordinance and doing uh, voter uh, registration on, in the black neighborhoods of Des Moines. And this is, uh, I go back into the history because it becomes important because it's there that they met a lot of the black kids who would later become the Des Moines chapter of the Black Panthers. Uh, now going on to Iowa, um, Bruce was one of also the people you may have, you've heard about him or his work because as a senior he was one of the leaders of the uh, Des Moines black armband case in 1966 where students were suspended from school for wearing black armbands in protest of the war. It became the Tinker versus Board of Education case decided by the Supreme Court in 1968. But he and his friend Ross Peterson were actually the two instigators of that. Um, and he was pressured to leave the school district very quickly after that and went to Iowa. Um, so, I think this is significant because the chapter had a lot of students in it whose draw to radical politics was the peace movement, uh, ban the bomb, and the civil rights movement. It's not about, um, you know, dorm restrictions or uh, uh, more, the more general countercultural stuff. That, that was certainly present and important, but it wasn't kind of the instigators of things that drew initially a lot of other people into SDS and chapters that were founded later on. Um, but that started to break into consciousness as the war became more important. Um, people started, one of the early draft card burners um, was a guy named Steve Smith, just a month or so after um, David Miller in, in New York City. Um, burned a draft card, and the FBI thought that was a pretty important thing. They sent agents out to Iowa City to arrest the guy after he burned his draft card in front of the Iowa Memorial Union. And uh, suddenly a, a, a small SDS chapter of 20 or 25 people was joined by a mass meeting of 300 uh, students who turned up when Steve Smith added, uh, asked for uh, help from the SDS chapter. Um, uh, Steve Smith was hiding out in my cousin Paul's apartment. The FBI came to find him. He slipped out the back way. And SDS had sent out uh, uh, the photographer Dee Gordon and uh, Jane Adams, a regional traveler, to help out. Um, and they met the FBI agents coming up the stairs and blocked them off. Um, these very official, you know, black suits, white tie, white shirts, black ties, coming up the stairs of this downtown Iowa City apartment. Uh, Steve Smith going out the back door, these guys coming up, D. Gorton blocks and says, I'm D. Gorton, who are you? And that stopped them just enough so that he could make his escape and later arrange to turn himself in peacefully because he's, he didn't think these guys were exactly peaceful. Uh, so the, from there the chapter kind of blossomed in terms of anti-war work, uh, uh, draft resistance in particular. Um, and uh, one of the um, important things about the chapter, um, which again brought national attention as Steve Smith's bringing his draft card had done, um, was following suit on Madison, Wisconsin. I think there's some Madisonites here of um, the popular tactic of uh, opposing the war by blocking recruiters for the military, Dow Chemical, other companies. Um, tried to recruit students on campus. You showed up, you tried to block them from coming in, you tried to argue with them, uh, tried to uh, rush your guys off campus, things like that. Um, in November 1967, following suit from what had just happened in Madison, a hundred and some students at Iowa were arrested. Um, 
and uh, uh, wound up in jail. Uh, a number of them, including uh, Bruce Clark, uh, found themselves uh, uh, indicted for conspiracy, uh, facing 15 years in prison. Uh, their crime was that they had coordinated two groups of demonstrators using walkie-talkies. So, conspiracy, uh, according to the Johnson County District Attorney. Uh, so, suddenly, um, people facing middle-class students, uh, facing very serious charges, uh, brought into the center of what was becoming uh, more contentious anti-war work, uh, where the chips seem, really seem to be down. Um, uh, hundreds of students coming to meetings at times. Um, seemed like we were on a roll. All kinds of respect around the campus from what people had done. Um, and in fact, the chapter was stymied. We didn't know where to go. Um, I'll read a little bit here. Um, at this point, police and university overreaction in the service of the government's Vietnam pol policies had the effect of turning large numbers of students against the system in general. White middle class students were now facing prison terms. Didn't this show that the system had to go? Though the Iowa SDS chapter seemed to have proved its militancy in a just cause and acquired considerable prestige on campus, SDSers were unclear about what their strategic orientation should be. Activists seemed to be caught in a cycle of provoking the cops then using the police overreaction to radicalize students and bring them into the movement. But then what? Chapter meetings reflected this concern with, for example, Faith Carney calling on the chapter to increase its militancy and its planning so that the next time we could pull off some, a march with some balls. Quote, unquote. Um, however, she never said and nobody ever thought, okay, what, what would that really be? Um, in March, the chapter was stymied in a debate, fixated on a false dichotomy between a focus on internal education and political development of the current membership, or expanding the chapter rapidly and gathering in large numbers of students who had suddenly become sympathetic to, to radicalism. Uh, at this point in 68, Johnson announced he would no longer continue running for president. Um, the May events erupted in France, workers and students shutting down the country. Uh, we watched that every night, as many of people here did. Um, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Um, we were wondering, okay, where do we go from here? And it seemed to many of us that what we had seen in France made sense. Workers really did have the power to shut down a country in opposition to a government determined to retain power. Um, at the time, uh, we were in touch with Earl Silbar, who we met at different SDS conferences, and it seemed to us that uh, the Peel and the Worker Student Alliance's uh, strategy of uh, orientation toward the working class and oriented, uh, a worker student alliance made a lot of sense. Um, we were, many of us, uh, needing summer jobs anyway, so it was not a big stretch to say, let's go to a center, let's get jobs, let's be part of this, see where it goes. Um, Joe Barry was one of those folks, and um, we talk, we mention the, the worker, the work-ins a lot in this book, but this is actually <laughs> something that Joe wrote uh, just after the 1968 work-in in an underground paper in Grinnell College uh, uh, in Iowa, uh, which gives a flavor of what people actually did because the work-in was, uh, work-ins were widely satirized and uh, caricatured by Time Magazine and other organs as students being sent in to uh, organize unions or something of this nature. Um, and of course that was not the idea at all. Um, students were, uh, the idea was to uh, get many mainly middle class students, students ha who didn't have deep roots in the working class, uh, to become familiar, what does it mean to be a worker? You go in and you work on an assembly line for eight, nine hours a day. 
What is that really like? What do people think? How do they talk? Um, what did they think about the war? Uh, it was not so much to settleize as to listen, to learn, uh, to exchange views, but it was not an idea of people going in to organize and lead people out. Uh, PL was wise enough to know that that was a non-starter and we were wise enough to know that was not going to be our role. So um, here's just an excerpt of some sense of what people did. This is in Chicago, where industrial area we all met, um, and also where we brought in more closely to work with uh, progressive labor members directly rather than talking to people occasionally at conferences or phone messages, letters, things like that. A number of Iowa SDS people were involved this summer in Chicago. Uh, participants met weekly in working groups that discussed, on a more or less theoretical level, the work experiences that people had at their jobs. Um, apart from the constant contact we had all had with working people every day, education combined with activism at two significant times was invaluable. The first of these was a wildcat strike led by black Chicago transit authority drivers, who were supported by some of the white drivers. The issue was primarily the fact that the present union is controlled by drivers who have no contact with the present job problems, but are still voting members of the union. This resulted in a racist, white-controlled union that, by dividing the workers, made the white drivers a bit better off than the lax, but kept both of them down. In this initial strike, our only action was to go to a few of their meetings to rap and also do some leafleting at factories and subway stations in their support. The other major action concerned a similar wildcat by drivers at the Railway Express Agency. An injunction was issued against picketing and working people picketed for the strikers and our lines were respected by over half the incoming drivers who deliver goods to the REA depot. Many good contacts were made with the drivers and many of these were very receptive to our radical analysis of society. Uh, although I <coughs> should add that at a great many times PL, people around SD, WSA mistook kind of cynicism, uh, kind of bitterness for a radical view, um, and so thought people were more radical than they actually were in terms of what they were actually willing to do. But nevertheless, there was a lot of bitterness, a lot of anger uh, in the streets, and uh, uh, a number of the WSA members were part of that, and uh, intermingled, worked with, supported uh, workers, um, and uh, found that uh, their support was appreciated. Um, coming in back to Iowa that fall then, um, we started this, the year with a SDS meeting of something like four or 500 people, um, although obviously most of those people were not gonna go to chapter meetings every you know, week and discuss stuff, but a big base of support. Um, and at that point, um, PL decided that the Campus Worker Student Alliance was where it was at. Um, and encouraged us all to get campus jobs, which most of us did because we needed jobs anyway. We're going to do that anyway, so why not go along with this? Um, and uh, uh, we uh, did other things as well as that, but we were diverted to some degree by the CWSA, uh, which was an odd strategy for us compared with um, experiences recounted in this book by students at Harvard, at Columbia, various other places, where you had a university encroaching on uh, black and Latin communities, drawing workers from those communities, exploiting them horribly. Uh, so there was a real basis for uh, an alliance with local people, campus workers who had a lot of issues with the university. And there was a lot of actually good work done there. Um, workers at the University of Iowa were mostly people driving in from farms. Um, not the same kind of consciousness as in Harlem, probably, I think you'd have to say. Uh, nice people, and what we did learn actually in doing these jobs, uh, like working in student union, was the absolute contempt of lots of the, not only the, uh, the, the fraternity and sorority folks uh, had for them, but also a lot of the countercultural folks too. Um, so we could see from the worker's point of view, okay, these people actually... Oh, wait a minute, this is wrong, you know. Um, at this time also, we uh, uh, got involved in strike support work, uh, similar to what I've had with, uh, with uh, Chicago in supporting, say, railway express workers. Um, in this case, it was uh, striking Teamsters, 
in uh, Cedar Rapids, close to Iowa City. And we went up, supported those workers, brought them back down to speak at anti-war rallies. Um, we also were driving over to Des Moines to support the Black Panthers, who we had met earlier and who we were able to work with, even though it was a PL-friendly WSA chapter that was highly critical of the Panthers, but because we knew these people, uh, we could talk with them, and we showed up to support them. Um, uh, so again, another kind of unusual experience based on the fact that we were kind of a, a ways away from the center of progressive Labor Party influence and kind of could interpret some of the things that were said in our own way. I'm going to call time on myself now, um, having said a lot about kind of what our strategy was and why we thought the Workers' Student Alliance uh, project made sense and how it seemed to work in a sense because we had allies in the state um, who were friendly to us, who were receptive, who liked our support, um, who we could talk to. Um, and I'll just wind up by saying that Unfortunately, there's sort of this kind of sectarianism that you'll uh, find discussed in this book undermined that, uh, those initiatives. Um, we found that the Workers' Student Alliance, from PL's point of view, um, was more a strategy to build influence amongst students in the student movement and draw them closer to uh, PL and its party. Um, but it was not really a strategic direction. It wasn't really a strategy to do what it said it was, of uh, building an actual political worker-student alliance that would uh, be a broad front for building power. Um, but there was the, the openings of that. I can see from our experiences that there were possibilities that we tried to take some advantage of, and with more astuteness, I think, other political movements could have made more of a difference than we were able to do so. So, thank you. People were fighting against imperialism in Vietnam. Mexico City, before the Olympics, the students had a major, major demonstration in the Zocolo. And we don't know how many were killed because helicopters came in and picked up bodies. And then there was France, and stuff was happening. Why did, I, why did we choose the title? I don't know, you know, desperation. <laughs> uh, John, um, that was a Beatles song. Man. It was a Beatles song. Um, if you take a look at why we chose, the title is connected to, you'll find it interesting to know, the, the picture on the cover, which is not, um, uh, the usual 60s picture is a cop beating a student or something of the kind. Uh, and this is a bunch of students kind of musing, talking, that's a sit-in, um, and it's a discussion, and the question is, where do we go from here? And the question, you say you want a revolution, what does that mean? And this is a, WSA was an attempt to, to answer that. You say you want a revolution, well, the way to get that is a